Good evening. It's okay to respond. Good evening. That, that tells me you're with me, you're awake, you're alive, and you're here because you love Jesus. So glad to be here with you tonight and um, expecting to worship with you. Thank you, Tim, for those thoughts already this evening. That kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. The focus of my message tonight is taken out of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus inaugurates his kingdom, and he... Uh, he brings it about in a way where people were maybe not anticipating it. They were not ready for what this, this new kingdom was going to be all about. I've been sharing a series of messages at Sandy Ridge the last while and focusing on the Beatitudes and what those, um, maybe what some of those mean. And I'd like to, this evening, just start off the message with, uh, make sure this thing works here. Can't see over my shoulder here. Uh, I'd like for us maybe together, I don't know if you can read this or not, this is out of the King James, if you can't read it, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, and I'd like for us just together to read the first six verses, and as we do that, uh, this is the beginning of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uh, kind of laying out the groundwork for this new kingdom, and the first couple of the Beatitudes here, well let me just pause, let's just read that and then I'll comment on those. So if you can follow with me, let's read together in unison verses 1 through 6, all together. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So, the first couple of Beatitudes here. Blessed are the poor in spirit. These first few uh, tend to show us who we are. Uh, maybe our poverty of spirit shows that we have a problem. You see, sin separates man from God. That's how we, that's how we enter this, this world, is we are separated from God. You take that all the way back to the original sin in the garden. And so there's a problem. And so man has been unable to have relationship with God because of that issue of sin, separation, all that goes with that. These first few show us that in order to come into the kingdom, we have to be poor in spirit. We have to recognize that we are destitute. That we bring nothing. We bring nothing of merit where God can, can somehow look at us and say, oh yeah, you're worthy. No, we come with an, un, in, an, an unworthiness. That's poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn, they shall be comforted. Looks at coming with a sorrow for our sinfulness. A sorrow for the violation we have uh, against God, the way, we've, the way we've sinned against him. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Also requiring us to humble ourselves in order to come to God and to come on his terms. So these first few focus a bit more on some of the negative dealings of ourself, dealings of the human heart. And we ultimately find that we are utterly helpless, we are weak, and we have been marred by sin. God's perfect creation was marred by sin. So as we get to verse 6, and right away I, I notice there's at least one couple here from Sandy Ridge. Sorry you're going to get a repeat here. <laughs> we, uh, I actually shared this this morning. But I believe that this, this verse 6 here, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, I believe this one is one of the key statements in the Sermon on the Mount. And if you want to think of it this way tonight, this is an excellent test to see whether you are in the kingdom of heaven as a Christian. This is a test. Your hunger and your thirst helps us see what is it that I am pursuing in this life. There's many trappings of Christianity. There's a lot of, a lot of visible signs of Christianity. But here's, here's where you kind of take that all away and get down to the heart. What am I hungering and thirsting after? And that's what I'd like to drill into tonight and, and look at some more. This verse also is a notable statement. It kind of summarizes the Christian gospel in some ways and everything it offers us. Because we are saved by grace through faith. All right, we bring nothing of ourselves. It's the gift of God. It's an amazing gift of God. And so this gift of righteousness that we're going to talk about here, it's, we have to remember it is a gift. And there had to be a righteous one who would come and bring his righteousness because ours was insufficient. And tonight I want to tell all of you, if you have not received the righteousness that comes through Christ, 
Someday you'll stand before God with an insufficient righteousness in the judgment. So that's the beauty of what Christ did. And it's, the, it's important that we make sure we know what is the source of our righteousness. It's not just our own, our own good works. Uh, thinking about the, the terms hungering and thirsting, my wife and I, many years ago, moved to the country of Belize in Central America and served on the mission field there for a couple of years, about three years. And I was a teacher, actually principal of a school down there, and we were just newly married, had been married about a year, and we went from this kind of a honeymoon year, an easy year, and we, we moved down there to Belize, and that first year was one of the most difficult years of our lives. But it was good. The Lord used it to shape us, to mold us in a lot of good ways. And one of the things that, that happened in moving down there was uh, the change of culture, change of foods. And I grew up here in northern Indiana, and so, you know, grew up on a farm, and I'm, I'm used to some just good old beef off the farm and you know, I was a meat and potatoes kind of guy growing up. Still am in, a little, <laughs> in some ways. But that's what I was used to eating. It's what I enjoy. Well, I knew moving down there, I had visited before, I knew that they eat some different foods. And I had been down there one time before, and I, and I remember observing in a home where they took an avocado, and they sliced up this avocado and just laid it there on the plate, and they were just chowing it down like it's the greatest thing. And I, I, I tasted it, and it was terrible. It wasn't good. I didn't like guacamole. I also was not familiar very much with cilantro, an herb that's pretty distinct, if you know what cilantro is. And, of course, the staple foods there are rice and beans and the, the chicken, uh, stew chicken or Ricardo chicken. And uh, so this became a part of our, our normal diet. And every Sunday, we had this for Sunday lunch down there. So we had chicken, rice, and beans. And at first, you know, I, I ate it, I enjoyed it. But I noticed that over time, I really started to enjoy it. And then you get, you know, you get... Uh, yeah, a piece of lime, and you'd squeeze lime over some of this stuff, and it was just amazing some of the flavors that I was starting to adapt to. I actually learned to enjoy a sliced avocado. You'd sprinkle a little bit of salt on it, and you'd pop it in your mouth, and not too bad. And fresh guacamole became uh, something I, I still enjoy today. But over time, over a couple of years, my appetite and my taste changed. And it came to the point that when we moved back home, uh, I kind of miss Sunday lunch being chicken and rice and beans. In fact, whenever we have it, I really, really enjoy it. But my appetite in some way was changed in probably in some good ways. I needed to adapt. But it takes time to change appetites, but it was a good thing. One of the things that also changed for me was uh, I grew up, we, we drank a lot, of, a lot of pop growing up at home. And also when I was a teenager, I got a job after I was out of, out of school and I worked in a wood shop. And at this shop, we used to have a refrigerator, and it was full of, of drinks. We had Mountain Dew and, and Mountain Dew. I think that's about all we had. Uh, we were pretty one-dimensional in those days, but we were young guys, and we really enjoyed the Mountain Dew. And so every day, when it, especially in the summer when it was hot, we'd pop a Mountain Dew. And I, I was thinking of this over. I thought, you know, did I have one a day? I think I had multiples a day. You know, we'd have one in the morning, and then by mid-afternoon, you're kind of, you know, you're kind of coming off your peak, and so you, you have another one. And... Uh, and so I really enjoyed that. Well, of course, one thing that happened when we got to Belize was you couldn't buy a lot of these foods. And a lot of the things that we're used to here in the United States were not available. And so the first six months of living down there, we ate a lot of just basic staple foods. And I didn't drink Mountain Dew. I didn't have meat and potatoes. I was basically chicken and rice and beans. I actually lost weight. So if you want to lose weight, I have a place for you to go. Uh, and so this was pretty good. Well, one day after being there about six to seven months, we went over into Spanish Luca, which is a Russian Mennonite colony, very close by. And we went to their big superstore there, kind of our Walmart. And as we were going through the store, I was looking through the cooler, and wouldn't you know it, I spotted a Mountain Dew tucked in back behind uh, some of the other, um, I was going to say Mexican sodas, but brands that, we're not, that we don't have up here. And I thought, this is fantastic. It's time to reward myself for, for abstaining for so long. So I bought this can of Mountain Dew. And uh, after we left the store, this ice-cold Mountain Dew was just really going to be great. So I popped the can open, and I took a big drink, and I was so disappointed. <laughs> My taste had changed, and now I was drinking this sugary, syrupy stuff, and I said, how did I used to drink so much of this stuff? And I really could not enjoy it. I think I drank the rest because I paid for it, but I did not enjoy it in the same way because my tastes had changed. My appetites were different. And to this day, I find it difficult to drink a straight Mountain Dew. It's just not the same. So over time, our hunger and our thirst, our appetites, they can be, they can be shaped. They can be changed. So think about that as we, 
as we go through this here. This, uh, this verse, verse 6, tells us that we are blessed. Blessing is also, another word for that in this, in this uh, context would be happy. Happy are those, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. The scripture doesn't tell us to seek after blessing. It doesn't tell us to seek after blessedness or after happiness. It says, blessed are those who seek or who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, one of the truths that I think is important for us to consider, because we can talk about what it's like in the world, but there's some realities in the church as well. The world is hungry for something. The world is hungry for satisfaction. And so there's the pursuit of pleasure, the pursuit of happiness. In fact, that's even, I don't know, is it in our Bill of Rights? I should have looked up for sure what it is. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, right? Every good American follows that pursuit. But the aim in life is pursue happiness, pursue satisfaction. And many people who don't know Christ, are, are their lives, they're searching for meaning. And so they pursue, what is it that can give me pleasure? What is it that can make me feel happy or find some kind of satisfaction? And you know that the more you seek after happiness for its own sake, the more often people end up in a very wretched state because there's ultimately, that's not, that's not what our pursuit should be. Think about a doctor, uh, a person who has pain. They go to the doctor and they have this pain they want to have dealt with. Now, it's very tempting to deal with symptoms. You know, take some pain medication and you deal with the symptoms and then move on, right? Well, a good doctor says, no, wait, there's more than just pain here. There's a source for the pain. What is it? And so a doctor looks to diagnose what's the problem. And many times uh, when people are pursuing pleasure, they're pursuing happiness, they're dealing with symptoms. They're not dealing with the, the issues of the heart. They're not dealing with the emptiness inside or possibly just the, uh, the brokenness of their hearts. And so there's a, there's a thing where the world seeks after happiness for its own self. But let's take it further than that. How many times are we in the church dissatisfied? We're not happy with our Christian, shall I use the word experience? And maybe that's part of the problem, is many times... Are we dependent on experiences to make us feel good about our Christian life? I don't feel this. I don't feel good. Maybe my church doesn't always feel good. Or I'm not feeling, I'm not feeling happiness in my current state. The question is, well, what are we hungering and thirsting after? Many people look for experiences to fill them with joy and feelings of blessedness, and they never seem to find it. They never seem to find it, and they wonder, why don't I feel different about being a Christian? Well, the key is in this verse. So you're blessed or happy if you hunger and thirst after righteousness. Well, what is this righteousness that this refers to? If this is what I should hunger and thirst after, what is it? What is righteousness? And I would propose tonight that there are maybe two, two uh, meanings coming out of this in this passage here. There's two parts to righteousness. There is the part where we are justified, we are made righteous. Romans talks about us being justified by faith, being brought into back to peace with God. But there's also a further meaning, a deeper meaning, where there's the process of being sanctified, becoming increasingly righteous, increasingly showing the character of God, increasingly demonstrating what Jesus is like and people seeing that in our lives. So let's, let's break those two ideas down a little bit. First uh, one I want to look at here, if you, I have it on the screen, but if you need to look it up in your Bibles, it's Romans chapter 3, uh, 19 to 31. And I picked two passages tonight out of Romans. The one speaks clearly about righteousness as justification and also a righteousness as sanctification. And I wonder sometimes if, if Christians, we kind of get, we kind of stop at the first one. We know that we need Christ to be saved, to be justified, but we're not always quite sure what, well, if that saves us, then what about the rest of this? Why are we asking, why are we telling people they should be growing? Why are we telling people they should be in the word and, and seeking Christ? If, if, if the sacrifice was enough, what, what are we doing with the rest of this? What about this thing of sanctification? Sin, I already said, sin separates man from God. So a man who truly longs for righteousness, who has this hunger and thirst, 
One of the reasons he longs for this is he realizes that I'm out of fellowship with God. I want relationship with God. There's a, there's a longing in the human heart to know God. Now, many people never, never find that. They never, they never get there. They go other paths in life. They pursue something else to fill the void. But I believe we've been created with, a, there's this place in the human heart for God to dwell with man. And so if we don't experience that, of course, there's frustration and there's, there's brokenness. So the longing, the, the hungering and thirst is that desire to, to, get it, to get back with God again. But there's also a desire to be done with sin. Uh, sin can dominate our lives. There's the power there that we want to have broken. Uh, uh, Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 7. He talks about just that, that wrestling that happens between flesh and spirit. He's like, in my mind, I desire, I want to do the things of God, but my flesh, I keep falling. And there's this wrestling, this tension of, I don't want it to be this way. And so a person who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, they, they wrestle with those things. They want to follow God, but they find that their flesh sometimes gets in the way. Let's read here now in uh, Romans chapter 3. I'll begin reading in verse 19. It says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin." But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. I'm going to just pause right there a little bit because of the page break. So there is a righteousness that is, it says, there's a right, the righteousness of God without the law. Verse 20 says, you were never going to be justified by the deeds of the law. All right? So you see there was the repeated offerings for sin through the Old Testament because there could be no enduring righteousness. It was necessary to, to have offerings, to have sin offerings, but... Ultimately, no flesh would be justified by that, by the law. The law revealed sin. And, uh, Galatians, I think, calls it the law was a schoolmaster. It led us to Christ. So here there was a new righteousness, a righteousness outside of the law. And it was a righteousness that would come by faith in Jesus Christ. That's very key to our, uh, to our belief that it is by faith that we come to Christ. Not, not on our own works, but it's through faith that we come. Then there's this word propitiation, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. As I looked into that word, um, the Greek word, I don't even have the Greek word written down, but the Greek word that you find for this word propitiation is used twice in the New Testament. The other time it's used is in the book of Hebrews, where it talks about the mercy seat, which was the covering, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. So in the Old Covenant worship, with the tabernacle first and then the temple, there was the most holy place. And in the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. And within the Ark were the symbols. There was the manna, there was Aaron's rod, and there was the books of, um, the, the tablets of the Ten Commandments were in there. And so it uh, talks about, I think it's in, Levitic, in Leviticus, where God spoke from this place. There was the two cherubim on the mercy seat, and this was the place where God was. And once a year, the high priest would go in, and God would speak from that place. So this propitiation, it's the same word for mercy seat and a propitiation. Now, I understand that the Greeks would have, would have used this word in reference to appeasing the gods. In Greek mythology, there's a lot of different Greek gods. And so you maybe have the god of, you know, there was the god of, of fertility. There was the god of, I don't even know all of them, but they had a number of different gods. And so in most pagan religions, the gods are typically not happy gods they must be appeased. And the purpose for sacrifice and the purpose for offerings was to gain the favor of the gods. And so if you were a Greek or if you were a pagan, you were offering, bringing your offerings to the gods, hoping that you could please them enough for them to show you good favor. All right? So that would be the idea of propitiating or trying to reconcile yourself to the gods. Well, that's not who the God of heaven is. That's not who the true God was. He is immutable. He's unchanging. He's not a moody God who you have to figure out what Moody's in today. And so in this sense, here it says this propitiation 
it's actually in reverse. Rather than man trying to somehow appease God, it says God hath set forth. He set forth Jesus to be the propitiation. For what? Well, for sin. You see, sin is what kept us from God, right? So someone had to reconcile man back to God. So God sets Jesus as the one. He's the one who would satisfy the requirements for sin and bring us back into connection with God. I love the, I love the meaning of that. It's beautiful. So this whole idea of reconciliation, it's not that God moved. It's not that God failed. Man fell. Man needs a way back. And so here Christ comes, and just through faith, through faith we can be justified by faith and seen as righteous in his sight. That's the first uh, meaning I want to look at in, in righteousness. Let's keep going here in the, this next part here. So it says, To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So he's the justifier for you and I if we've come by faith in Christ. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it as one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So he wasn't dismissing the law. He says you can't receive righteousness by the law. It has to be through faith. And so the conclusion of the matter, Paul lays out very clearly, is we conclude a man is justified by faith. So think back to our, our beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. So first of all, we are made righteous by faith. It's the righteousness of Christ. Our own righteousness was never going to be sufficient. In the Old Testament, it calls it, our righteousness was like filthy rags. It, wasn't, it was not pleasing to God. So our righteousness by faith through Christ, by that we can be justified. And I want to say right up front here, I believe that this faith in Christ, this justification, can happen immediately. Uh, the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I believe that is an instantaneous action. We are instantly made right with God. We are justified. We are made righteous in his eyes. And we can have confidence in that. So the question remains, why sanctification? If we're made right with God, why should we worry about being made further righteous? What, what is this? If we're, if we're made right in God's eyes, what's the next part all about here? I thought of an illustration as I was trying to come up with a way to describe uh, the difference of sanctification and justification. And, and the reason I feel led to explain this probably is because of my own journey as a young person uh, coming to Christ and, and just struggling for a number of years. Am I truly his? Am I truly born again? And if I sin, doesn't that jeopardize my standing with God? And, and so this, this seesaw battle of the mind sometimes where, am I in? Am I not in? Calls me a child of God, am I? And, and doubting that and wondering, how do, you, how do you reconcile all those feelings, all those thoughts? So I'd like to illustrate to you <clears throat> a way that helps me think it through. And I, I'll say up front, every illustration can break down, all right? So I want this to be something that maybe helps you think about it in a way you, you maybe have not before. The process of justification maybe like a field. I'm a farmer by trade, and so I like talking about farming stuff. So let's say you have a field just down the road here, and the field is covered in weeds because it hasn't been farmed for possibly a few years. It's covered in weeds, and you could say that, that field is it's unproductive. It is not fruitful. And in a spiritual sense, you could say it is separated from God. This is an unfruitful farm, and it, is not, uh, it has not been reconciled, okay, if you want to use that terminolo terminology. So the farmer comes and he says, I want, to see this, I want to see this field become fruitful. So he comes in with a deep chisel or a plow, and he, he goes through and he rips up the field. And there's all these weeds, and they kind of tangle up. And, you know, when you initially go through a field like that, you still see remnants of the weeds, right? So then he comes with his disc, and he chops that up some more. And it really is starting to look a lot better. And then he comes through with a field cultivator, and he really works it to the point where... 
at the end, you see a nice, beautiful field of dark soil. Beautiful. It's ready to receive seed. It's ready to produce a crop. I like to liken that to justification. That we come by faith, we are made right before God. You could say this field is free of sin. There's no sin. I don't see any sin out there. There's no weeds. It's gone. It's completely clean. And that new life is planted. That seed, the farmer plants the soybean, he plants the corn, whatever the crop is, and he puts it in that soil. And you could say at that time, this, this field is pure. It's without sin. Well, you already know what's going to happen next, right? The seed begins to grow. It sprouts and it begins to grow. But there's often some remnants there of the old weeds, right? There's still some, maybe some tendencies there. There's some seeds remaining. And as the good seed begins to grow and it starts to flower and, and to, to mature slowly, think of being a young Christian coming in Christ, there's some weeds there too that are starting to grow as well. Well, an attentive farmer gets on it right away and he says, I got to go do some cultivating. I got to go spray the weeds. And he starts to deal with those weeds and, and he works on it. And as, as he works on those weeds, the good plant continues to grow. And it continues to mature. And we like this stage as farmers when you hit about, oh, maybe late June, sometimes later than that, maybe, maybe July, especially in soybeans. All of a sudden, the soybean, it bushes out so much that the field just is solid green. And all the ground is covered. There's no sunlight able to reach the ground. Well, that suppresses weeds, right? As the, as the plant matures and flowers out, it suppresses the weeds. And I'd like to liken that to the process of sanctification, Sanctification, let me give you a quick definition for sanctification as I, as I see it. It's the uprooting and removal of our sinful desires, and that comes through a constant yielding to God. So I have heard many stories of deliverance where people come to Christ and their addiction to drugs and alcohol, and some of those things are completely gone forever. That's a blessing. That's amazing when that happens. But I also know sometimes people do come to Christ, and there's still the remnants of that old life. There's still those those appetites, if you will, that are still there. And they find they have to, they got to work on it. They have to create new appetites. Um, I know uh, in our church, I know of at least one brother who used to smoke uh, when he was a younger man. And he said, it, it takes a while. And he chewed gum and he did all kinds of stuff to, to retrain his brain. And there's these certain triggers that all of a sudden there's a desire to smoke because whenever I used to be stressed, I'd smoke. And those things, those are things that are, they're in, they're part of who we are and they have to be retrained. And so this process of sanctification is over time, as we grow, as we seek after righteousness, some of those desires begin to fade a bit. And there can be a point even where we begin to despise the sin that we once indulged in. That's that process of being sanctified. Now the question, maybe, maybe for you it's not a question, but it's the question I've struggled with over, over the years was, in that process, am I, fully, am I fully saved? Am I fully, truly a child of God? I want to say a resounding yes. Can we lose our salvation? I believe it's possible. But can we be secure in our salvation? Yes. And that process of sanctifying us is, making, is bringing us closer and closer to the character of Jesus. In one place, Paul says, be perfect. But then he also says, go on to perfection. And we are made perfect. So in one sense, we are made perfect, and yet we become more perfect. We become more and more where actually our desires. And that's maybe one of the things that um, we notice in the scriptures. I think it's Paul maybe talks about this in Romans as well. So it's not only that we were in bondage to sin and needed deliverance. God gives us deliverance. But we kind of liked it too. We liked the sin, right? We kind of liked being in that state because it, it felt good. We enjoyed it. And so while we can be set free from its bondage, there also has to be a turning away and a turning to the things of God, that hungering and thirst for him that begins to change our appetites, kind of like what it was uh, like for me in Belize and having some new appetites. Look at another scripture here, and this is more focusing on the process of sanctification. So we are justified by faith. And now look at Romans chapter 6, verses 12 to 23 here. This gives us some scriptures that we do have a part in sanctification. There are some tests that we want to put ourselves through as well about how am I hungering and thirsting? What are my hungers and my thirsts? Actually, uh, what's the reality of that? I'm going to start reading here in verse 12. 
It says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, but that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now think about that a little bit. As those that are alive from the dead, those that have been born again, he says, don't yield your members to unrighteousness. Don't give yourself back to the things you used to do. You gotta, you've changed. If you're alive from the dead, then yield them to God. Say, God, what do you want me to do with my life? Change my desires. Change me from the inside out. He's calling them to make a choice here. So we do play a part here. And then verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for, you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. If you're in bondage to sin tonight, you don't have to be. If as a Christian you struggle repeatedly with sin, he says, sin shall not have dominion over you. And why not? Well, the reason, he says, is because you're under grace. You're not under the law. So I, I take that verse to mean there was a time where sin did have dominion over you. When we were under the law, we still were not set free. We still were not justified. And so there you, you look back in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, there was that repeated offering for sin, right? Because sin had dominion. There was a repeated offering for sin. How many times did Christ have to be offered for sin? Someone tell me. How many times did Christ die on the cross? Once. Once for all. Once for all. So we are under grace. The sacrifice was enough. The power is there. Sin does not have to have dominion over you. So think about that. And Paul almost anticipates what would come next, because in the next verse he says, What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace? Is grace licensed now to do what I want? Because I've been justified, right? And so therefore, if, I, if my sin has been dealt with, the penalty has been dealt with, should I just sin because I'm under grace? He says, God forbid. Absolutely not. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. All right, so here, here's part of the test of this beatitude. I said at the beginning that this is a test to show, am I in the kingdom as a Christian? Am I truly born again? Here he says, part of the test is, who are you obeying? To whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are. So if you're, if you're yielding to sin, who's your master? If you are yielding to Christ in, in obedience to righteousness, who's your master? That's the test. Who are you yielding to? That's the test of whether or not you are, you are in the faith, whether or not you've been born again. And then he, he says some encouraging words, verse 17, But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin. Forgot to put a highlight up here. God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. Now, in that verse, when he says, you've yielded yourselves, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity. Unto iniquity, that word iniquity means lawlessness. A person who is lawless is they have no regard for law. There is no restraint. They respect no law, no law of the land, no law of God. They are lawless. So he says, that's who you were when you were servants to uncleanness. So now... Because that's who you were, now he says, do this instead. Yield your members to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things, whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So having been set free by justification, you are now a servant of God, all right? You are a servant to God. That's what you hunger and thirst after is, God, what do you want me to do? It's a yielding to him. God, what are your purposes for me? What shall I do? And then he says, we become fruitful. Ye have your fruit unto holiness. You will become more and more like Jesus. 
If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you become more and more like Jesus. That means changing in your character. That means that that fruit of the Spirit is evident in your life. People see you. They see love. They see joy. They see peace. They see the evidence of God dwelling within you. But there's an ultimate reward as well. He says the end is everlasting life. That's the part we really get excited about too, right, is the end. But the end isn't here yet. So in this time now, that fruitfulness needs to be happening. As we, as we hunger and thirst after righteousness, God produces fruit in us. And we show his character. Then the last verse here in this passage. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice two key words here. Wages and gift. Somebody tell me what wages are. Something you earn, Something you earn right? You get a paycheck. It's your wages. You get your wages equal to the investment of your work, right? So our wages for sin was death. We earned it. That's the payment. He doesn't use the word wages when it comes to talking about eternal life because you could never earn it. You could work from now until the end of your life and try to please God, and it would always be insufficient. It's a gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So simple and yet so profound, right? It's a gift. It's a gift for those who come in faith, who come and they seek his forgiveness and they are justified. They are made right and their lives are changed and now they move towards becoming more and more like him. I read a quote here by a man by the name of J.N. Darby. I don't actually know uh, exactly where he said this, but it's, it's remarkable to me. This is about that hungering and thirsting we talked about. That desperation for God. He says, to be hungry is not enough. I must be really starving to know what is in his heart towards me. When the prodigal son was hungry, he went to feed upon husks. But when he was starving, he turned to his father. We know the story, that downward spiral into sin that the prodigal son had. And finally, he ends up in the pigs. And yet, even when he's with the pigs, he eats their food, right? He's hungry but he's still not quite at rock bottom. The one who is hungering and thirsting after righteousness is desperate. God, I need you. I need you alone. That's all I need. And when the prodigal son hits rock bottom, he realizes, like the first couple of Beatitudes, poor in spirit, I have nothing. I'll go back and be a slave rather than a son. He's meek. He humbles himself. He comes and, and basically throws himself before his father. That's the spirit he comes in. And he comes, and rather than simply being fed a little bit like a servant, he's surprised to find that there's a party waiting for him. There's a party there for those who come back to the Father. And he kills the fatted calf and there's celebration. But until we come to the place where we are hungering to that point, we are starving, where we're done with our own resources, when we're done with trying to earn it, when we're done with being good enough, we recognize that I need a Heavenly Father. He's the only one who can meet the needs of my heart. That's when we truly begin to feed, uh, to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And ultimately, righteousness, I don't know if I mentioned this at the beginning, but righteousness really is, it's whatever's right, whatever's good. It's the essence of who God is. Whatever conforms to the revealed will of, will of God, that's righteousness. And so sin marred all that. And so how do we get back, get back to that? As I bring this to a close here, I'd like to put us through several tests of spiritual appetite. And as, as you heard me describe tonight, the process of, of being justified by faith, being justified in the righteousness of Christ, but then going on to perfection and that process of sanctification where we take on his righteousness and we become more and more like him. Maybe the best test is, what do I hunger and thirst after? If you really want to know, am I seeking after God? then think about your appetites tonight. I'm going to put you through a couple of questions to think about. The first question I want to consider is, is this one. It's maybe not even in a question form. It's more of a statement. A self-awareness of our own false righteousness. The Apostle Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 3. He had all the credentials of a man who was somebody. He was a Pharisee. He, I believe he uh, had been taught by Gamaliel. He had the credentials. He had the lineage. He had so many things going for him. And Paul says, I count all these things but loss so that I can gain Christ. These things are like refuse to me. They're worthless to me. 
when it comes to seeing, uh, to seeing Christ. It's not that they weren't beneficial to Paul, but he recognized these mean nothing to God. I need him completely. And so one of the tests is, are we aware? Are we aware of how we present ourselves to God? Is there a part of us in our own heart that thinks that, you know, I'm not that bad. I haven't been as bad as this guy over here. I haven't gone maybe deep into sin. And there's a part of us that, that kind of hangs on to our goodness to a, to a degree. That's still, we still fall short. All of sin and come short of the glory of God, brothers and sisters. We still all have to come to God in the same way. So one test can be, are we self-aware of our own maybe false sense of righteousness or of rightness in our lives? Another test is the avoidance of everything that is opposed to righteousness. This might go a bit down the road of appetite. Um, I talked about some of my appetite changes at one point. Think about the things that you seek after, the things you enjoy, whether it's through uh, media, through entertainment, through the books you read, through the things that you enjoy just pursuing as hobbies, all those things. Is any of that opposed to righteousness? Is there anything that maybe dulls your appetites? A little bit like our children sometimes. They come in, they say they're hungry. You know, they want to eat, right? And we say, well, you know, lunch is in 10 minutes or it's in half an hour. Just wait. Why do we make them wait? Well, why do we make ourselves wait? Because we kind of get the same feelings sometimes, right? We know that that takes the edge off of an appetite, right? If you're constantly snacking between meals, then your hunger for good stuff is just not as acute, right? So if you're constantly feeding yourself junk, what happens when you're exposed to the goodness? And think about the, way you, the, way, the things you feed on spiritually. If you continue to fill your mind, and there's so many ways we fill our minds. We have a pipeline of, of stuff coming our way in this age. There's so much that you can fill your mind with. But is any of that dulling the appetite for the things of God? Do you find it hard to sit under preaching? Do you find it hard to enjoy a discussion about the word? Do you find it hard to, to pray? Those are the things that can be opposed to righteousness. So a person who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, they recognize those things and they say, I don't, I don't need this in my life. No one has to tell them. They say, I don't want this. This, this is against what I'm after. I want the thing that satisfies. And by the way, I don't even think I mentioned it yet. The beauty of this verse is that the end, it says... They shall be filled. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's a promise. They will be filled. You will be satisfied. And, and yet the beauty of it is, is the more you hunger and thirst, the more you hunger and thirst. And the more you get filled, the more he keeps filling you. It's kind of like a, it's like a river, a raging river. And it's just, it's just constantly flowing. There's just more of it. And that, the, the desire increases. So on one hand, we are fully satisfied in Christ, and yet we hunger for more. Paul says, let's go on, let's go on to perfection. Like, let's let's go for the next thing. And there's that sense that we are we are completely satisfied in Christ. But as we find that satisfaction, we realize there's so much more. There's so much more, and our eyes begin to be open to some, some realities there. But if it's opposed to that, if it's squelching our hunger then avoid it. That's another test of of what our spiritual appetite truly is. Number three, to hunger and thirst after righteousness means we place ourselves in its path. If you truly are hungry, you want God, you want to grow, then you place yourself in a position where that's possible. And the best illustration I could come up with is the story of blind Bartimaeus. And his prospects were not good. I think he was blind from birth, and there was no hope. I'm sure he had seen every doctor he could, there's no hope for him. But he hears one day that Jesus is coming down the road. I'm sure the stories of Jesus had preceded him. And so Bartimaeus knows, this is a man who has the ability to heal me. So what does he do? Does he sit in his home and say, boy, I sure hope, I sure hope he leaves the path he's on and comes to my house today? Absolutely not. Bartimaeus will say, I have got to get to the place where I know he is. And so he He gets to the road where Jesus, he knows he's passing by, and he can't see anything. And here comes the crowd, and all he knows is he's hearing noise, and he's assuming somewhere in there is is hope. And he makes a scene. He hollers, and Jesus, son of David, have mercy. You know the story. He creates a scene to the point where Jesus stops. And he comes to Bartimaeus, and he gives him his sight. 
That would never have happened had Bartimaeus not sought after the one who could give him sight, right? We place ourselves in the path. So on one hand, it's not a righteousness that is our own, but for us to grow in it, we have to place ourselves in places where we can be with those who are righteous. We grow by being with, with God's people. That's why we come to church, is to be with the saints. We come to hear the word. We come for all these different opportunities we have. We place ourselves in the path. So if you find your appetites waning and you say, I don't have an appetite, then are you placing yourself in positions where you can grow? Uh, we had Brother John Koblenz at our church last weekend sharing some weekend meetings. And one of the things he mentioned was that God, the thing that God desires from us is, first of all, that we love him, and secondarily, that we know him. And those two are so linked. I've been pondering that the last week. How can you love someone you don't know? If you're married tonight, you know your spouse. And the more you know them, the more you love them. And the more you love them, the more you want to know them. That's why we read the word of God. And sometimes we can approach the scriptures looking at it in terms of, well, I want to get something out of it. Or we come to church and I want to, re- get, I need a nugget, Lord. Give me something to, you know, to, to work on this week. Or I need something. And sometimes we don't always feel that. I'm actually reading through uh, Exodus and Leviticus right now in, in my one-year Bible. It's a little dry sometimes. And so if I, if I read that simply and saying, well, God, I, how am I supposed to apply this today? Well, it's not always that way, but we get to know God. We read his word to know him. We read to know about his character, the way he works with his people, the desires of his heart, the things he feels. And so we get in the word to know him. We have to put ourselves in its path. That's actually the next one. To hunger and thirst for righteousness means we study the Bible. It's so basic, but you've got to get in the word to know the author. If you want to know the one who wrote it, read it. Get to know it. And we can, uh, we can learn and grow through that process. Many times we make the excuses that we don't have time. We don't have time. I don't have time to be in the Word. I'm busy. I have to get to up, to, up early for work and all these things. Well, I understand. But I believe we, we make time for the things that really matter. We do carve out time for the things that matter. If you're up to date on the news, but you're not in, your, in, in the Word, I think I know one thing you could cut. That's just talking from personal experience. I like to read the news. I like to know what's going on. But that can compete with my time with the Lord. So what are you willing to get rid of? What are you willing to carve out to get to know God? We have to be intentional. A person who hungers and thirsts, if they want to hunger and thirst, they have to create that environment where, they, where that hunger and thirst can grow. I think back to my illustration of the foods we ate in Belize. My appetite for those foods increased because I ate them. It's just that basic. You, you eat, you absorb God's word, you get into that, and you start to realize that, you know what, I, need, I like this, I need this, and there's a hunger, thirst that grows. And then number five here, another test, to hunger and thirst for righteousness means that we pray. Very, very basic, and yet very essential. We don't ask. We don't get what we don't ask for, Right? need to ask so that we can receive. If you want to hunger and thirst, you're not quite sure where to start, ask. Ask God. You know who wants you to hunger and thirst after righteousness? God does. He, he would love to hear you say that. Lord, I, need to, I want to hunger and thirst after righteousness. I want to bless you as you think about this beatitude tonight. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They will be filled. They will be filled. God will fill you. And if you want to do an interesting study, go through the New Testament, look up the word filled. There's so many things he wants to fill us with. He fills us with the Holy Spirit. He fills us with joy. He fills us with peace. He wants to pour into us and fill us, which that's ultimately the source of blessedness, right? Blessed are those, happy are those, satisfied are those who go to the right place for for blessedness. And he he will deliver it. Bless you as you continue this process in your life. And I would like to pray before we close, but my prayer is that you would increase in that hunger and in that thirst, that longing, that that glorious longing, like Paul says, it's the supreme desire of his life. You could call it a passion of his. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So I want to know him. 
I want to know this power. I want more of him. And the more he, he became uh, enthralled with God, the less his past, the less the things of this world meant to him. So God bless you as you seek him with your whole heart. Shall we pray? Father, tonight I pray that you would show us where our true hunger and thirst lies. Lord, what a rich promise you've given us in the Beatitudes, in the Sermon on the Mount. You've promised us to be filled if we hunger and thirst after righteousness. Father, thank you so much for giving us the way through Jesus Christ. We can be justified by faith because you finished the work on Calvary for us. We're grateful for that. Lord, give us the Give us the passion and the desire to know you more. And Lord, as we are, as we in the in the in the process of uh, being sanctified, where those desires are changing, those appetites are increasingly uh, bent towards you. Lord, I pray that you would help us, uh, help us where we fail, help us where we need to readjust our our vision and our focus again. And I just pray, Lord, that in this church here at Salem tonight, I pray that there would be a deep longing to know you, to love you, and to be filled by you. So thank you, Lord, for your, your truth. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. We pray this in the worthy name of Jesus. Amen.